This is B6 lesson 1 and it's about DNA and the genome. So if you look at the structures that are on the connect screen, you need to be able to put these in order of size, so the largest first. So if you think about it and use your common sense, you'll be able to see here that the cell that you're used to seeing, the cell that you're used to seeing has a nucleus. So the cell must be the biggest one. Because if it wasn't, then the nucleus wouldn't fit inside it. So the next thing that comes is the nucleus. And you often tell us when we ask you that you know that the DNA is in the nucleus, but often people use these two terms, DNA and chromosome, as if they are interchangeable and they mean the same thing, but they don't. If you look at the chromosome, you can see that it looks like it's made of fine hairs. What it is, is it's actually a strand of DNA. And then a small section of that DNA is a gene. So the next one is chromosome. And that's made of DNA. And then a small section of DNA is a gene. So that's what or that they're going in terms of size. So we're doing about DNA and the genome so that you can describe the structure of it, explain the principle of complementary base pairing, and then define the genome and its importance. So in Trilogy, you need to be able to describe the structure and you need to be able to say that the genetic material in the nucleus is in the nucleus of a cell and it's made of DNA and that it's just a polymer made up of two strands forming a double helix. So you don't need to know it in as much detail as a triple. At triple, you need to actually know the bases and you need to know what a nucleotide is. But we'll go through all of it. So if you look at the structure of DNA, it's got two strands. It actually, if you unwind, it looks like a ladder. But you can see in this diagram, it's twisted. So that part of it, the twist, is called a helix. So it's called a double helix because it's two. it's got two strands and it's a helix. So double helix. We also describe it as a stable polynucleotide. So a nucleotide is a small section, so it's a bit of the ladder's side and then a bit of a base, which if there's four types of bases, there's adenine, there's thymine, there's guanine, let's hear look, and cytosine. So the reason I've done in that order is because A, adenine, always pairs with T. So they are, and um, which is thymine, so they are always together. A, T, always together. And then cytosine and guanine always pair together. So guanine always pairs with cytosine, good company. So always together, good company. And that's called complementary base pairing. So those two bases complement each other and they always go together. They're actually secured between them with bonds called hydrogen bonds. So H bonds, which are actually very weak. So when the um, DNA strand is twisted into its helix, those hydrogen bonds on the middle are protected. So it doesn't matter that they're weak. So that means then it can be a stable polynucleotide. So if we unravel it and we look at it from an A-level point of view, you can see that the sides of the ladder are actually made of chemicals. So you've got your deoxyribose sugar there. That's deoxyribose, but it's actually a sugar. This part is called the base. The bases are made of nitrogen, so there's four nitrogenous bases. And then this is made of phosphate. So it's got a phosphate sugar backbone, which is what this part of it is. Then it's got complementary base pairing. Adenine always pairs with thymine. Guanine always pairs with cytosine. Always together, good company. And then the bonds between them are hydrogen bonds. So this is triple only. So in triple, you have to know what a nucleotide is. So this is one monomer of DNA. So it's called a, a nucleotide. And a nucleotide consists of one of the nitrogenous bases, the sugar and the phosphate group. 
Now, that base can either be A, T, C or G. So there are four different nucleotides. And the nucleotides, when they join together here, are actually joined by bonds called phosphodiester bonds. You don't need to know that, it's just for interest. But they are bonded together to form a polymer called a polynucleotide. So if you have a look at this slide, you don't need to know this at GCSE, but it is interesting, so I'm just going to go through it. So if you look at this strand of DNA, so it's done as a ladder for simplification. So you can see they're always together, good company. A and T are always together. They can be A and T or T and A, but they always pair together with the hydrogen bond in the middle. So what happens when DNA replicates? So that's when DNA makes a copy of itself. And you'll have learned last year in year 10 that DNA needs to make a copy of itself during mitosis. So during the growth phase of mitosis, um, so stage one, which is the growth stage, it copies its organelles, does the cell, and it also copies its DNA. And this is how it does it. So what happens is the DNA unzips up the middle with an enzyme and the hydrogen bonds are broken. And these are free nucleotides that are actually in the cytoplasm. So there's some adenine ones, thymine ones, guanine ones, cytosine ones. They're just hanging around in the cytoplasm. And when the DNA strands separate, they're highly attracted to their complementary base pairs. So they go towards them. And then hydrogen bonds are reformed by another enzyme. But what you end up doing is you get two copies. Now, if you look carefully at those copies, they are identical. And that's why complementary base pairing is important. Because A and T always pair together and because C and G always pair together, it means that you get two identical copies. And then the significance of the blue and red strands is that you can see that the new DNA is always made from half of the original DNA. So we describe this as semi-conservative, so it's half the original DNA. But all you, you don't need to know this in stages, you just need to know this DNA replication and that it happens in mitosis. So what we usually do now, so you can do this at home if you want, you can make your own DNA model using jelly babies, or you can make your own DNA model using straws. So we're just going to move on to the genome now. Now the genome is the entire genetic material of an organism so the entire genetic material of an organism so my genome would be all of the genes that are in my dna so if you looked at a pig's genome that would be all of the genes in the pig dna and if you looked at vi a viral genome then that would be all of the genes that were in that virus so the entire genetic material of an organism of a living thing and it's interesting to know that it actually took 12 years to map the human genome. So people have been working on it for years, but that can be done now in a matter of hours on a computer. So our sequencing techniques have adapted over the years and become better. So why do we need to know about the genome? Why is it important for us to know exactly what genes are where? in a genome of an organism well first of all we can track human migration patterns so from where humans resided initially on the planet they've moved from there and they've moved around there's a little video here that you'll be able to click um it'll be in the notebook so if you have a look at this one it'll show you where humans were fir first started off and where they went to and the reason that we know that information is because when we found remains and we've checked the dna profiles of them or the entire genome of them we can see that they've got similarities so we can trace where they actually went where they settled we can use this technology for developing medicines and treatment for genetic disorders 
So if you have a look at this video, it'll tell you about how they're using genomics in healthcare. So um, if people who've got type um, type 1 diabetes, they can have a look at the gene for that. People who've got genetic disorders like cystic fibrosis, they can locate the gene and they can go towards like replacing it with a healthy gene in gene therapy or modifying the gene in some way so that it doesn't actually cause any harm. And then they can all also use it for treatment of diseases, diseases like communicable diseases, diseases like the coronavirus. So if they've mapped the genome of the coronavirus, they will be able to use enzymes or other technology to be able to break it up, to be able to stop it from being able to reproduce and infect anymore. And there's a video on that as well. So we've been doing lots about careers. So you can be a genomic scientist and what they do is they examine patient samples to identify genetics and genomic abnormalities which might cause inherited or acquired diseases. So they work closely with other healthcare professionals. So they might work with people with the genetic disorders or they might work with the infectious disease agency. And in order to do that, there's a list of skills that you can look at here. So obviously you're going to need lab skills and you need to be able to plan and design your own research. Excellent interpersonal and communication skills. The average salary is from 43,000 to 102,000, so it's worth pursuing. And you need a university degree with an integrated master's in genetics, which you do at the same time. So what I'd like you to do now is you would pause the video and you, you can write this out or you can type it into your notebook, but you need to explain how the structure of DNA is related to its function. Or if you're doing trilogy, you can just describe the structure of DNA.